Okay, so now that we know what an atomic sentence is, we know what its constituents are, and we know how to create one in our notation, we're going to move on to the discussion of uh, correct inferences. The focus of this chapter then is distinguishing between logically correct and incorrect inferences. We're going to use terminology such as validity and invalidity, logical consequence, non-consequence, and then related concepts, soundness and unsoundness. So let's go ahead and get started on some definitions and then let's look at these, uh, how these definitions play out so that you can have a, um, a sense of what we're talking about. So um, we talked earlier about the idea of um, using sentences that are either true or false, that is using sentences with a truth value uh, as constituents of what are known as arguments or what is known as an argument. And an argument is a set of statements or sentences, one of which is supported by the other or others. Another way we can put this is that an argument's elements, um, l uh, let me rephrase that, uh, what tif typifies an argument is that the sentences that make up an argument um, have a specific relationship to each other, and that is uh, a relationship of inference. So when we have one or more sentences that are the constituents of an argument, we say that one of those is inferred from the other or others. Now, the inference that we make is going to be logically correct or not. Another way to put this is that the inference is or is not a logical consequence. And still another way to put this is that the inference is valid or invalid. We can say uh, that an argument as a whole is valid or invalid. So what we're talking about is this. We're talking about what sort of relationship the evidence has to the sentence that is inferred. Let's take a look at the fourth bullet point. A logically valid argument is one whose conclusion is a logical consequence of the premise or premises. This means that it is impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premise or premises are true. So we know that an argument consists of at least one sentence that serves as the evidence or reason to believe the other. And that sentence, the one that serves as evidence or reason to believe, is called the premise, the conclusion is the sentence that is supported uh, by the premise or premises. So we're going to start using this uh, technical terminology and it'll just become part of your repertoire. So now let's return to that uh, bottom uh, bullet point. Let's see what we're talking about when we're talking about, about a valid argument by using Tarski's world. It's a really great way for us to understand what is meant by a logical consequence or what is meant by a logically correct inference or what is meant by a valid argument. Okay, take a look at uh, the sentence pane in Tarski's world. You'll see that we have two sentences written in um, our system's logical notation. The first sentence says A is larger than B. The second sentence says B is larger than C. Now, it should be the case that you infer from the first two sentences the third, a third sentence, namely that A is larger than C. This is what's known as an analytic consequence. I'll say more about that later, but for right now, let's instead use the uh, uh, terminology that we've just introduced. When we say that A is larger than B and B is larger than C, it therefore must be the case that A is larger than C. There's no way around it, if you will. In other words, when we draw the inference, and I'll go ahead and write it here, um, 
a larger than c and i'm just using the buttons because um, as i've pointed out before using the buttons um, ensures that we don't have any sort of logically gram ungrammatical uh, structure here so anyway number three as you can see is indented a little bit and this is a way for us to recognize that three is uh, an inference from one and two together so um you didn't nobody told you that three is an inference from one and two you intellectually grasp this because of the sort of relationship that's established by one and two together the way that we can demonstrate that three sentence three a is larger than c is a logical consequence of one and two is to construct a world in which one and two are true and then see if we can make three false in other words can we build a world in which one and two are true while three is false another uh, approach would be to do the same thing but backwards to uh, build a world in which the sentence a is larger than c is false and then see if we can still build a world in which the sentences a is larger than b and b in lar is larger than c are still true so um, let's go ahead and, and start with uh, the process whereby we build a world in which sentences one and two are true. So I'm going to generate three objects. Um, it doesn't matter what their shape is. Um, so I'll just keep them um, the shape that they're given. And I will name each respectively C, B, and A. Now I'm going to create a world in which A is larger than B and suppose that I don't automatically or very quickly see that um, A has to be large in order uh, for the second sentence to uh, come out true. So suppose for example I start by making A medium and I leave B small. It's true that um, when I click on verify that A is larger than B, right? But we can see that it's not the case that B is larger than C. So what has to be the case in order for the first two sentences to be true? Well, A is going to have to be large and B is going to have to be medium. Now sentence two is true and sentence one is true as well. Now the fact that when we hit the verify button for sentence three we get a true is not what makes the argument valid is not what makes sentence three a logical consequence of sentence two instead what makes this argument valid is the fact that the meanings of the predicates larger than in connection with the individual constants a b and c bearing uh, specific, that specific relationship to each other means that A has to be larger than C. Now, could we build a world in which one and two are true and three is false? No, it's not possible. So the language that I'm using is important here. There is no possible world, given the meanings of our predicates, that sentences one and two can be true while sentence three is false. So we can't falsify the conclusion and that then lets us see um, that we've demonstrate, or sorry, let me rephrase that. That le then lets us see that three is a logical consequence of one and two. Um, another way that you can think about this that I think is, is helpful here is the following. Um, when we build the world for sentences one and two, three is automatically built. So let me start over and show you what I mean by that. Okay, so we've got three objects. We've got uh, C, B, A. When we build the first uh, relationship, A larger than B, we make A medium, we leave B small, and it's true that A is larger than B. But when we move on to the second sentence, we realize that B and C are both small. And so in order for the sentence B is larger than C to be true without contradicting the truth of the first sentence, A is larger than B, 
we have to make A large and B medium. Now, <clears throat> this is where my point about the conclusions dropping out or my point about building the conclusion when we build the premises comes into play. By building A is larger than B and B is larger than C, we automatically build a world in which A is larger than C. When an argument's uh, conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises, in this case where we're talking about um, a, uh, a physical world that we can make, a, a spatially uh, recognizable world that we can make, it is the case that we can show the conclusion appears when we build the world of the premises. So it's a way of saying that the conclusion drops out or is uh, implicit in the premises. Now, let me offer you up another example where, again, we've got a relationship and by meanings of the, according to the meanings of the predicate language, but also the way that the relations um, are from A to B to C, it's not the case that we get a guaranteed conclusion. So what if I have the following sentence? A is larger than B, A is larger than C, so B is larger than C. So it is true that A is larger than B, and it's also true that A is larger than C. And if we click verify all, we'll see, and we can also see visually, that B is larger than C. But here's the, the key. The fact that B is larger than C is not going to tell us anything about the quality of the argument. In other words, the fact that in this world, B is larger than C comes out true. It is a fact that B is larger than C, in other words. Does not mean that the sentence B is larger than C is a logical consequence of the premises. So how do we know this? Well, it's simple. Remember earlier I mentioned the following. When, you, when it's impossible to falsify the conclusion while the premises are true, we say that the argument is valid or that the conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. On the other hand, when your premises are true, you can build a world in which your premises are true, but you can falsify the conclusion. So let's go ahead and make B and C the same size. We have a situation in which the premises are true, the conclusion is false, which means that the premises do not guarantee the conclusion, which means that the conclusion is not a logical consequence of the premises, which means that the argument is invalid. So now that we have a really nice visual way of showing how validity and invalidity or logical consequence and non-consequence work, let's go back to the abstract concepts. Recall the last uh, bullet point said a logically valid argument is one whose conclusion is a logical consequence of the premises. So what we're saying here is that it is impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. This is just what a valid argument is. Here are some examples that we can't represent in Tarski's world, right? Because the content has nothing to do with um, uh, the block's language. But we could take the form of each and we could represent the inference in the block's language. Since, however, at present, um, there is only, or sorry, there are only two arguments that um, satisfy our current notation, um, that is, that satisfy our notation for atomic sentences. I won't do that. I won't uh, use each example. Um, we, when we get to chapter three, we'll, we'll be able to, to do that. Um, but what we could do is look at the last two. So let's read through these and see how, uh, your, how, what your comfort level is. If I don't have any quarters, we can't ride on the Ferris wheel. I don't have any quarters, so we can't go on the ride. In other words, I've asserted this if then sentence. I've maybe looked in my pockets and I've said, yep, don't have any quarters. It follows therefore, that we can't go on the ride. 
If Lulu has a flat tire, she won't be here. But look, she just showed up. She's here. So she doesn't have a flat tire. Now, some people like to say, well, wait a minute, you know, Lulu could have taken the bus or Lulu could have grabbed an Uber or something like that. True, but recall that we're working within the framework of this argument. And this argument is restricted to the following sentences. If Lulu has a tire, she won't be here. She is here. Her being here is a negation of the consequent, namely the sentence, Lulu won't be here. This next one should probably uh, be pretty intuitive for you. I'll have pancakes or French toast. They're out of pancakes, so I'll have the French toast. Next, no flibdoddles or gluttets. All quamines are gluttets, so no quamines or flibdoddles. Now, um, I could actually build a world uh, in which we change out flibdoddles and gluttets uh, for um, the blocks language of Tarski's world. Um, and we could uh, uh, show the relationship. Uh, but if we were to write out the notation, we would be in um, chapter nine. So maybe what we could do is just look at the world um, and we could write out the sentence in ordinary language and then um, and not worry about the translation into logical notation. Next, we have Stuart is identical to Stuffy. Stuffy is a sweetheart, so Stuart is a sweetheart. Here again, we can swap out the um, names Stuart, Stuffy, and uh, sweetheart for, um, well, sweetheart is what we're predicating of Stuffy, I should say. Um, but we could swap out the name Stuart and Stuffy uh, for uh, uh, blocks language names, right? And sweetheart, the predicate sweetheart for some relationship uh, or for some uh, single place predicate. Same with Lois is taller than Reggie. Reggie is taller than Jamil. So, so. let's go ahead and take each one of these in turn. Uh, in the uh, in Tarski's world. Okay, so you can see that we have the um, arguments from the slide we were just discussing uh, written out in ordinary language form. Um, each argument is in a single sentence um, old. And what I'm going to do um, to point out this idea that we're looking at the form of the argument and not the content is I'm going to maintain the form, but I'm going to replace the content with um, items from Tursky's world that we can build. So what's the form of this argument? Well, we're saying no A, whatever A is, R, B, all C, R, B, so no B, R, A. So we've got the form. Now let's replace A, B, and C with um, Tursky's World um, buildable items. So how about this? No cubes are large. All tets are large. So no cubes are tets. Now you might say, well, the sentence no cubes are tets has to be the case. Uh, by virtue of our understanding of what the um, uh, predicate cube and the predicate tet means. But what we're after is what is guaranteed based on the structure of the argument, not the form, right? That's how we get this argument that we um, just retranslated or sorry, that's how we understand that this argument we just translated into the blocks language is valid. So we build a world and we'll make a couple of cubes and we notice uh, that none of them are large. We will make a couple of tetrahedra and each one of those will be large. We can see that the conclusion drops out None of the cubes are tets. Now we have Stuart is identical to Stuffy. Stuffy is a sweetheart, so Stuart is a sweetheart. So what if we uh, replace Stuart with A? A is identical to B. Let's say that 
uh, B is a cube. That means then that A is a cube. Right, so let me go ahead and just clean up our, whoops, clean up our world a little bit. Um, A is identical to B. B is a cube, so A must be a cube. Lastly, Lois is taller than Reggie. Reggie is taller than Jamil, so Lois is taller than Jamil. We can easily make a, an analogous uh, relationship appear by way of the last uh, time we used our used Tursky's world to introduce the concept of validity. A is larger than B. B is larger than C. So A is larger than C. Right? A is larger than B. Lois is taller than Reggie. B is larger than C. Reggie is taller than Jamil. So Lois is taller than Jamil. A is larger than C. So here we would need to do what we did earlier, namely make A larger than B. And then we need to make B larger than C. And when we do that, the conclusion automatically appears. Now we have some examples of invalid arguments, that is, arguments whose conclusions are not logical consequences of their premises. If I have 10 pennies, I have 10 cents. I have 10 cents, therefore I have 10 pennies. Remember, if you find yourself saying not necessarily in response to the conclusion, you're on the right track. Think about how you can falsify the conclusion. Another way to put this is, see if you can come up with a counterexample. If I have 10 pennies, I have 10 cents. I have 10 cents, therefore, well, I could have a dime. I could have five pennies and a nickel. You get the idea. It's possible I have 10 pennies, but it's not a guarantee. Next, Klaus won Wimbledon or the US Open. He won Wimbledon, so he didn't win the U.S. Open. Now, we're going to learn this in a little bit, that the or in logic is not exclusive. When we, in our everyday language, say one or the other, we typically mean but not both, which is an exclusive or. But logic doesn't know from exclusivity unless it's asserted. So, when you have an or, each side of the or could be true. Think about it this way. If I say, Wonder Woman uses a lasso, therefore, Wonder Woman or that cowboy uses a lasso, is a legitimate inference. It, as long as it's true that Wonder Woman uses a lasso, then it's true that one or the other does. We don't know if the cowboy does or doesn't. Maybe, maybe not. So the or could be true. Uh, uh, sorry, rephrase. It could be the case that both sides, if you will, of the disjunction are true. So when we say that Klaus won Wimbledon, we're not entitled to infer that he did or did not win the U.S. Open. Next, some flowers are annuals, some flowers are perennials, so some annuals are perennials. If you know for a fact that the first two sentences, that is the premises, are true, and you know for a fact that the conclusion is false, then you can say, ha, huh, okay, whenever I have true premises and a false conclusion, the argument is invalid. Whether it's true premises and a false conclusion in fact, or I can falsify my conclusion without violating the premises. Lastly, or sorry, next, Lois is taller than Reggie. Lois is taller than Jamil. So Jamil is taller than Reggie. Let's give each of these people height. Let's say that Lois is six feet tall and Reggie is five feet tall. Let's say, uh, now we know that Lois is six feet tall. Let's say that uh, Jamil is five foot seven. It's true that Jamil is taller than Reggie. But we could very easily do the following. 
we could say Lois is six feet tall, Reggie is five feet tall, and we could say that Jamil is also five feet tall. And in that case, Jamil is not taller than Reggie, right? So just saying taller than, particularly when we've got the sort of relationship that we're uh, trying, or sorry, we've got the sort of relationship that's expressed, namely Lois, 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 is, Lois is tall and Jamil, we're not given any information on what exactly that means. So since we can plug in any numbers we want, where the goal here is to make true premises and a false conclusion, we messed up the first time, but the second time when we made Lois six feet tall and Reggie and Jamil five feet tall, we were able to falsify the conclusion. When you can falsify the conclusion, uh, either because you, you, um, are, you're able to do that without contradicting the premises, or let's say in the case of the uh, flowers example, the conclusion is actually false, then you know that the structure of the argument doesn't force the, uh, the preservation of the truth from the premises to the conclusion. And lastly, if I have 10 pennies, I have 10 cents. I don't have 10 pennies, so I don't have 10 cents. You can falsify the conclusion in the same way that you did with the first example involving um, uh, the 10 pennies, 10 cents sentences. Now, um, when we're working in the Fitch program and as a, as a sort of standardization of organize, organizing, organizing, that's good, organizing our arguments, we uh, put the premises one on top of the other, then we draw a line and we put the conclusion underneath it. In Fitch format, we have a, uh, a, a vertical line and then what's known as the Fitch bar or a short uh, horizontal line that's perpendicular to the vertical. That is the line that separates premises from conclusion. You can see the form and then an example. Now, you know, working in Tarski's world, that the premise-conclusion relationship is not explicitly um, um, visualized in terms of a, uh, a line drawn under the last premise to separate it out from the conclusion. So what you do is you just uh, say, okay, well, however many premises I have, if I'm going to be working in Tarski's world, I'm going to have the last sentence be the conclusion. So we typically work on a vertical, and that also helps us when, we're, um, when we move into derivations. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Fitch program using um, the skills that we've just recently begun to develop. So this is exercise 2.7 from our text, Language, Proof, and Logic. And you'll notice that the uh, um, premises are laid out one on top of the other. And then below the last premise is the Fitch bar. Now, as we work and we derive a line, you'll notice that the um, Fitch line, the vertical line, continues. The program does this automatically for us. So the idea is you continue to derive lines and then uh, until, rather, you get to your conclusion. Now, um, what we want to be able to do is understand the process of deriving lines, but also how we cite and justify each of our inferences. So now is, is a good time to say that the process of a proof or a derivation is to demonstrate how and why a sentence follows from another or others. So the process of a, a derivation is a process of meticulously accounting for every valid inference that you can make. Now, we typically want to make um, our inferences as efficient as possible, but we also don't want to skip over steps. So, here's what we do. I won't do all of this because in some uh, classrooms this exercise might be assigned for homework, and so um, I want to be uh, respectful of that. But I can say that um, the first uh, line that you derive has got to be an inference from either 
lines 1 and 2 or 2 and 3. You will, unless you are uh, highlighting a subproof and we haven't got there yet, you will always cite at most two lines in a derivation. So let's suppose uh, that you take lines 1 and 2 and you draw an inference from it. If A is in the same column as B and B is identical to C, we can say that uh, A is in the same column as C. Now we're going to need a rule to justify the move. We also need to cite our line numbers, there are two in this case, that uh, we used to derive line four. So at this point, we hope we're comfortable with the identity uh, symbol and how the identity elimination rule functions. And we can say, uh, and I say can on purpose, we can say that the inference to four is by way of identity elimination. Now we can check whether or not we're correct in terms of this specific inference by clicking the check uh, um, button. Check this step, as you can see the highlight. When you want to check your entire proof, you will click on the button to uh, its immediate right where you verify that you've done the proof correctly. Uh, please note that in some cases you may have done uh, completed a proof correctly, but there may be some special instructions in the text that you did not follow, in which case you would uh, get a, an X, not a, um, a check mark. Now, this inference is also considered an analytic consequence of sentences one and two. And there will be more to say about Anacon, but suffice it to say that Anacon is the most general rule that we're given in this uh, version of the system that we're learning. It's not a standard uh, rule in logic, uh, but it's the largest, or the it's it's the concept of validity with the greatest scope. Um, that may not may make sense now, but for right now, you can just think of Anacon as um, a way of asserting that your inference is valid. So each of these cons, which is an abbreviation for consequence, has a particular meaning. I mentioned that Anacon is the most general concept uh, that we use when we talk about validity. Then there's first order consequence, which has to do with um, some items that we haven't yet learned, uh, but include some of the items we have already learned, like the identity symbol and uh, the uh, predicate language. And then TOTCON is a, an abbreviation of tautological consequence. And if we test out the inference using the TOTCON move, we'll see that we get a big X, and the question is why? Well, the short answer is TOTCON isn't applicable because we require additional notation in order for us to use it. So let's back out of this and go back to ANACON. As I mentioned before, ANACON tells us uh, when the green check mark shows up. Uh, Anacon tells us that the inference is valid, that number four is an analytic consequence of one and two. Another way to put this is this, is as follows. Just by analyzing the meaning of same column and the identity symbol, in addition to the names listed in the way that they are, that is, A is in the same column as B and B is identical to C, we get the inference. By means of analyzing 1 and 2, we arrive at 3. As I mentioned earlier, initially, we can use um, the identity uh, a limb rule to also draw 
or justify, I should say, the inference, right? So if you're a little bit confused about what the identity symbol means and how it's used, uh, then make sure that you take a look at the worry. Stay tuned because we are going to get to the discussion of the identity symbol shortly. All right, so I mentioned at the outset that we're dealing uh, primarily with the evaluation of an argument in terms of its structural correctness. And the structural correctness has to do with the ways in which the sentence's elements relate to each other. When we have a valid argument, that is an argument whose conclusion uh, is a logical consequence of the premises, and the premises are actually true, we have what's called a sound argument. So take a look at uh, these two examples. Both of the arguments are valid. The first one is sound, the second one is not. Now, we spend very little time on soundness when we're dealing with uh, derivations, and that's generally because we don't have very often the means to determine the truth or falsity of a set of premises. Nevertheless, it's important to understand that a sound argument is the best sort of deductive argument. That's because it includes already the concept of validity. So a sound argument is valid and the premises are all true. If you don't know the truth value of each of the premises in these two arguments, then you're not in a position to determine soundness, but you should at least be able to determine validity. If Pierce College is in Woodland Hills, California, then Pierce College is in the United States. Pierce College is in Woodland Hills, Therefore, it's in the United States. This argument structure should look familiar. Remember the argument, if I don't have any quarters, we can't ride the Ferris wheel. I don't have any quarters, so we can't ride the Ferris wheel. It's the same form. Now look at the second example. If Pierce College is in Woodland Hills, California, then Pierce College is in Zimbabwe. Pierce is in Woodland Hills, so it's in Zimbabwe. The uh, first sentence is false the conclusion is false. The argument is still valid, but it's not sound precisely because the first sentence is false. Now that we know the difference between a valid argument and an invalid argument, we want to turn our attention to what we're talking about when we say that we want to prove the conclusion of a valid argument. And I and you already have a taste of this. Um, a little bit ago I had talked about how um, there are uh, arguments, uh, the, the proof, uh, proofs for which involve very many lines, uh, detailed argumentation, if you will, that uh, justify getting from a premise or set of premises, or in some case, in some cases, no premises at all, to a sentence that is true. What we don't want to do is say something like, well, I just see, I recognize that the conclusion is true based on uh, what's given to me, based on the premises. Um, we want to be able to demonstrate that uh, relationship. And of course, in some cases, it's not at all clear that the conclusion follows from the premises. And so a lot of work has to be done to uh, uh, make that, um, a lot of demonstrative, demonstrative work, sorry, has to be done in order to show that relationship. So uh, as, as you've already seen, we're going to use uh, two ways to um, show our work. One is we will cite the line number or numbers from which a specific inference uh, has been derived, and we will use rules to justify uh, that step. So let's uh, focus first on a pretty intuitive inference, uh, what language proof and logic calls the indiscernibility of identicals, which is abbreviated in the FOL rule, as you've already seen, as identity LM. So um, let's go ahead and start with an informal proof, and then we'll move into formal proof, and you'll recognize that you've already seen it because we uh, created um, one, in, at least one, in the uh, in Tarski's world, and then we saw one um, get started anyway by way of exercise 2.17 in Fitch. Okay, so here we have uh, an informal proof. 
of the claim that Stuffy isn't a feline. Stuffy is a dog, and all dogs are canines. So, Stuffy is a canine. But since no canines are felines, it follows that Stuffy isn't a feline. This informal proof is written out in ordinary language prose style. Compare that with Fitch style, where we have ordinary language sentences translated into symbolic logic notation. We put our premises one on top of the other and our inference underneath the last premise. And there may be multiple inferences, right? But we uh, order them ver on the vertical and we number them. Lastly, when we make an inference, we cite the source or sources of that inference and we use the justificatory rule, whatever one is appropriate. Here we have identity elimination. So line one says Stuffy is a dog. Line two says Stuffy is identical to Stuart. So by identity elimination from one and two, Stuart is a dog. This should look familiar. We saw something uh, like this when we were just looking at Fitch, when we were looking at exercise 2.17. Now let's uh, hone in on the identity symbol. So um, you'll notice that I'm using the language identity to uh, name the two uh, uh, horizontal lines, one on top of the other. Um, that symbol oftentimes is called the equal sign. But in our system of logic, it does not mean uh, equals in the sense of a sum, right, where you're um, combining numbers to generate uh, a third number. It does not mean is similar to, it does not mean is equivalent to, but still different, right? Um, it is the is of identity. So if we're going to say that X is Y, we're saying X and Y are one and the same thing. If you have two cubes, you would not say that two cubes are identical. They, they, have, they share the same shape, right? They're cubes, but they're not one and the same object. So we wouldn't use the identity symbol to refer to two separate cubes. Take a look at the formula a is identical to B, B is identical to C, so A is identical to C. What we're saying is that ultimately A, B, and C are one and the same thing. When we use the rule, and we use it in chapter two, and then we're not going to see it again for a while, which I think is a little bit unfortunate because it, it sort of drops off the radar, um, but uh, when we do use the rule, this is the form of the rule. Notice that we're not talking here about A's, B's, and C's. We're not talking about Stuart. We're not saying that Samuel Twain, uh, Samuel Twain, Mark Twain is identical to Samuel Clemens, right? We're using abstractions so that we can put any content in that we want. Now on the vertical, we get the following. If some named predicate exists and is identical to another name, in this case M, then M also has that predicate. The dots underneath the P and the uh, uh, N in parenthesis, parentheses and beneath the uh, identity of N and M is meant to tell you that um, the inferences or sorry, that the premises and then the ensuing inference don't have to occur one immediately after the other. <clears throat> so now let's take um, a, an argument in ordinary language, look at it in the um, symbolic logic notation that we've learned, <clears throat> excuse me, and see how the indiscernibility of identicals is employed in the identity elimination rule. And I'm just sticking with identity elimination in this video. It's intuitive and it's the one that is mo used most frequently in our version of the system. All right, so we have the following. B is in the same row as C. In addition, B is identical to A, so A is in the same row as C. Now let's look at the Fitch style. 
same row BC, B identical to A, therefore same row AC. The justification is identity elimination from lines one and two. And here is a screenshot of an inference, uh, sorry, of an argument and a short uh, derivation to the conclusion. We have uh, the three premises, A is medium, B is larger than A, B is identical to C. Sentence four is an inference, sentence five is an inference. Notice that one and two are justified by Anacon. Right now, when we're first starting out, we really don't have any, uh, we, we don't have enough stuff to work with, so our uh, justificatory um, moves are pretty limited. You, you'll notice as we move forward that there will be a whole set of rules that we'll be able to use, but right now the best we can do when we know that A is medium and B is larger than A is to say, well, then it is an analytic consequence, therefore, that B is large, right? Once we get um, more um, notation to use, we'll be able to employ rules that go with that notation. But I hope it's clear enough to s that that um, line four is an analytic consequence. In other words, just by thinking about and understanding what medium means, what larger means, and knowing that the names A and B bear these specific relations to each other, that it must be the case that B is large. And then we have lines three and four yielding line five. B is identical to C and B is large, C must be large. Remember, B is identical to C tells us that B and C are one and the same thing, one and the same entity. And then you'll notice at the bottom, the conclusion large C, which is our goal, has a check mark to the right of it, and we get the note, the goal checks out. That means we've done everything correctly. Okay, before we leave chapter two, um, let's just remind ourselves of a test for non-consequence. Remember that we don't always know that an argument uh, we see is valid or invalid. It's not always obvious. So to test an argument for validity involves trying to come up with a counterexample. Another way to say it, what I've been saying most frequently is, we see if we can falsify the conclusion without contradicting the premises. So let's take a look at this uh, uh, argument and see what, uh, again, what we're talking about. A is a cube, A is small, B is a cube, therefore B is small. Well, all we have to do to show that the conclusion is not a consequence of the premises is to make A a small cube and to make B a cube, but make B larger than A. That demonstrates the invalidity of the argument. I hope that this uh, somewhat extensive video is helpful to you as you enter, embark upon uh, studying uh, logical consequence and non-consequence. Uh, the reason why I spent a fair amount of time uh, discussing the material is uh, the these related concepts uh, can be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around at first. So seeing these concepts in a couple of different environments, talking about them in a couple of different ways, should help you begin to wrap your head around them.